At the same time, as you carry out acts of violence, Adam's initial price was a visa to visit America. And the White House and Capitol Hill looked to Hume for guidance. Senator Kennedy began making phone calls uh, to President Clinton, explaining what he had heard from it. And President Clinton's initial reaction, like almost everyone else's, was, we, we can't do that. Hume, is, Hume, what's Hume saying? Adams is a terrorist. And Kennedy said, no, you've got to understand what's going on. Hume is convinced that Adams is ready to make this huge decision to move towards peace and reconciliation and end the violence. By backing a visa for Adams while the violence continued, Hume knew he was going against the advice of many in his party the stress was beginning to take its toll. I think that the IRA treated him like dirt for a period of time. I actually was in a position to see him suffer politically. And he used to visit me quite often in those days. He visited a whole lot of people, but he came to my house. And um, I mean, the tension was unbearable. It is the best opportunity in 20 years that I've seen and the Prime Minister describes me in that statement as courageous and imaginative. Why has he rejected my proposals before he has talked to me about them? He must have been smoking 60 cigarettes a day in those days, and it was, it was unbearable. Um, sometimes I used to say to him, don't take it, John, just go out and slap them back. Hume persevered. And eventually, in 1997, he was back to where he'd started 25 years before, in negotiations based on the same principles of power sharing and all Ireland bodies that had led to the Sunningdale Agreement. At the core of Hume's belief was the need to resolve three sets of relations between Ireland and Britain, North and South, and those within Northern Ireland. Now, amid talks about talks and negotiations based on those principles, Hume's vision was becoming a reality. In addition to being an architect, really the architect of the process, John was an indispensable force to keep going. That is, no matter what the problems, no matter how difficult or how hopeless it seems, we've got to keep this going. Uh, and he reminded me personally often, and he reminded the other Northern Ireland participants often, uh, of what was at stake. John likes to know uh, the, the principles and, and what the bottom line was. I mean, John would never be on the drafting committee I and mean, stand in orders at Borham anyway. So uh, I, I think, but he, he, he kept, you know, his unique piece has been able to filter in and out to, to everybody. And as I recall that week in the fine negotiation week, uh, John was about all of the time. When you were standing often for what seemed interminable amounts of time in corridors and waiting for the next meeting, John would kind of sidle up to you and say, oh, just draw you aside a little bit and say, you know, I think if you look at this or you look at that, you might find a way through this. And that was his, he was a, he was, the, he was eternally sort of prompting and pushing and prodding the thing forward. Um, and did it almost like a, a kind of independent <laughs> advisor. I mean, it wasn't, you know, he wasn't, I mean, he was obviously very conscious of the nationalist position, don't misunderstand me, but he, he didn't, I never regarded John as sort of of a particular party in that sense. I mean, he was kind of, aside from it, or maybe even above it. I now declare this plenary session adjourned, sine die. The whole world is watching what's happening here today on this very historic day, locally, nationally, and internationally, and that strongly, I think, strengthens 
the whole mood among our people, which is very powerful in all sections of our people, for uh, agreement and for peace and stability. And for a moment, Hume became a pop star. It's a very big thing um, in my life and my family's life and our band's life that we were invited to be a small part of, of what was a, a, a tectonic shift in Irish politics. The Nobel Peace Prize followed for John Hume and David Trimble, the leaders of the moderate parties that guaranteed the peace, but were eaten up in the process by the extremes. Getting agreement in Northern Ireland was central to resolving the problem, because, as I have always said, it was the people of Ireland who were divided, not the territory. And when people are divided, the only way that a problem can be resolved is not by violence, will only deepen the division, but by agreement. You see the house where I live up there? The black and white tops. In 2004, Hume stepped back from frontline politics. Although struggling with the effects of ill health, he remains a very public figure around his beloved hometown. Ten years ago, John was in Austria for a peace conference and he became very ill. And this resulted in three major abdominal operations and a period in intensive care with a ventilator. I think at that stage he suffered some brain damage and so he has memory, quite severe memory problems. Um, th these weren't manifested too quickly, but increasingly since he retired, his memory difficulties have increased. There's a party from Canada who's walking the walls. John? Well, welcome to Derry. Oh, thank <laughs> you. you. Whereabouts in Canada do you come from? Montreal. 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 Oh. In Ottawa. In Ottawa. So in you, Ottawa. Used, you used yeah. to speak French then? I do. French. Oh, oui. Vous parlez français toujours? Oui. Bienvenue à Derry. Merci. <laughs> he keeps himself very busy. He is quite independent. He goes to his Derry City matches. He um, goes to the local every evening. He, um, he stays very much involved in events in the town and um, does a bit of walking. So, so hopefully that will continue. I used to reflect about how it took so long to get to where we now are. And one of the reasons is that there wasn't somebody prepared to break the cycle, and John Hume did that. I have no doubt that he will be seen as the catalyst for the entire peace process um, and the visionary who saw it before anyone else did. He's the one that went to Adams and said, hey, look, let's talk. He's the one that built the support in the United States. He's the one that got Ted Kennedy and the others involved, and he's the one that got Bill Clinton to engage and see the possibilities, and I think that's how he'll be seen. It would not have happened without John Hume. He's seen as a man who cares about the human person and the dignity of the human person. And that's what he champions. He champions a world in which that dignity is honored and vindicated. Well, would you ask those men that have stopped firing rubber bullets and women, please? The Sunningdale Agreement, the Anglo-Irish Agreement of 1985, the Good Friday Agreement, and everything that has flown from that. The fundamental policies set out by Hume were the policies in those um, successive agreements. And that's why I say without any hesitation that the leadership of Irish nationalism moved from Dublin to John Hume for 30 years. <laughs>